This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where I'm speaking to Marion Whitehead from the Blue Mountains Botanic Garden in New South Wales, Australia, part of the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney. I'm talking with Marion about one of her areas of speciality, the intersection of plants and human beings, particularly in the context of three books as recommended by Marion, Enie Blyton's The Magic Faraway Tree, Francis Hodgson Burnett's The Secret Garden, and The Overstory by Richard Powers. Marion starts by talking about her journey into horticulture and her current work. I started out in a plant way. I studied a double degree of history and botany at the University of Sydney, which I loved. And both my parents did the same botany degree before me. And before that, my grandmother did the same botany degree. So we all love plants. And then when I finished, there weren't any jobs in plant science, which is what I was sort of looking to do, except for tobacco companies, which I wasn't that keen on. So I actually took a bit of a left turn and thought, what else do I love doing? watching television. So I applied for a job at a network TV station in Sydney and I worked in television marketing for a few years, but then I just wanted to get back to my roots and back to plants and being inside all day just didn't suit me at all. So I applied for an apprenticeship at the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens, which is one of the only botanic gardens within a World Heritage listed wilderness in the world and at quite a high altitude for Australia. And I got an apprenticeship there and started my career in horticulture, which was completely different to the razzle dazzle of television marketing. But I just felt so much more at home with my hands in the dirt. And I found out pretty quickly once I started my apprenticeship that I was pregnant. So I did the first sort of seven, eight months of my apprenticeship getting more and more pregnant, which made weeding harder and harder. But <laughs> the change from working inside, it snows up in the mountain, not that regularly, but I sort of found myself one day, six months pregnant, weeding around a tree and it started to snow quite heavily. And while that seemed like it could have been a terrible thing, I couldn't have been happier. I feel like it was the best decision ever. And when I finished my apprenticeship, I started working as a horticulturist at the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens, where I'd done my apprenticeship, looking after woodland and a heath and heather area. And that was amazing. And then we had fires come through in 2019, 2020, and they actually came into the garden and burnt the areas that I looked after. So after that, I moved out of the woodland and the burnt heath and heather and into the nursery at our site and started propagating and record keeping in there. And from there, I've been acting as the supervisor of ornamental gardens more recently. So looking after our bigger displays and coordinating all the horticulturalists in our organization. So it's been a roller coaster ride of a career. Yeah, sounds it. You seem to have a lot of different interests in the horticultural sphere. So I suppose that all makes sense through circumstance and through probably your interest in lots of different things that are seemingly quite different. I guess all that makes sense. So one of the things that we're here to talk about today, one of the many aspects of horticulture that fires your interest is the intersection of plants and human feelings. And I wondered what it was about that subject that drew you to it. You know, what made you look into it? The thing that I love when you talk to people about horticulture, whether or not they are a professional gardener or a home gardener or they just like plants, is that everyone seems to have one or two particular stories about a plant or a moment in nature that really drew them into it. So my big thing was sweet peas. My grandmother and grandfather used to grow them and they'd bloom at my birthday. And so sweet peas my whole life have smelt like my birthday and are consequently my favorite flower. And anyone I ask about why they like plants, it's very rarely an adaptation that the plant has or something scientific about it, but it's something 
emotional that they think of when they see a particular plant. So I love knowing those stories. I like the stories behind plants and I like people's personal stories behind plants. When we were communicating pre-interview, it was recommended that I look into three books that have particular resonance for you in this area of interest. One of them was Magic Faraway Tree, which was my favourite book growing up. So I was delighted to actually get hold of a copy of that and reread it. And I got the original edition that I had when I was a kid. So I got properly transported back. And I was interested rereading it because I thought, although the tree, the Magic Faraway Tree itself is a central character in the book, in retrospect, it seems fairly inanimate. You know, it's kind of like somewhere where people live and they climb up it and things happen around the tree. Is the tree the important bit in that book? And if so, do you think that it does provoke emotion? I think it does. Look, I feel often plants, they create a sense of place and they create a mood and a feeling that you don't get in a built environment. And that was always, I think, the thing with the magic faraway tree. While it was like Silky and Moonface and the Saucepan Man, who were the really bright, bubbly characters in it, the faraway tree itself for me just held such a mystique. The way that it grew different fruits on different boughs and it took you to different places is so analogous for me to so many plants that I see in the garden in which I work and gardens I visit, but also out in the bush up here in the Blue Mountains where I live, that they set a mood and a feeling which can't be matched by anything man-made, I think. Which leads nicely on to another observation that I had reading the book, which was that in the book, plants seem to have a dual role. Those in the vegetable garden kind of evoke drudgery and punishment because the children have to do chores. You know, they can't go to the enchanted forest until they've done the chores that need to be performed in the garden. So it's almost like a form of punishment. And yet the forest, on the other hand, just provides magically, you know, there's food to be gained for free. But I felt that it always came at a price. So, you know, with the good experiences, there are bad and it seemed very sort of yin and yang. The forest could be raw and brutal and it could teach lessons, but then it could reward much more than your vegetable garden could. And so do you think there's maybe a suggestion that wild plants are more emotionally provocative than cultivated ones? That's a hard one. Look, I think they evoke different emotions, wild plants and cultivated ones. I was thinking about this and I was thinking about, I watched a film on Netflix recently. I can't remember what it was called, but I think it was In the Tall Grass. And I was thinking about how corn and tall crops are always used as this really scary backdrop in a lot of horror films, like Children of the Corn. But I think that they can be equally evocative, but I do think that plants out in the wild, out in the bush, I live right in the Blue Mountains National Park, you can get lost more in such a larger landscape. But it makes you think as well when you said that there's the yin and the yang. With the bushfires that I mentioned before that we had in 2019, 2020, I'm a trail runner as well. So I run out my back door and into this world heritage wilderness, huge eucalypts and big old angophras and in the winter, just amazing terrestrial orchids and heathlands. And it's stunning. And when these fires came through, I was watching the bushland that I can see from my house. And I was thinking, please don't burn. I didn't care about my house, but I didn't want to see these places that I love this bushland that I know every tree intimately burn. And inevitably it did because 80% of the national park that I live in burnt. And so the first run out into this just scorched, transformed version of the bushland that I knew was so devastating, but also so interesting to see how different it could be. And it made me appreciate what I had. And then in a cyclical way, because a lot of the plants here are used to fire, not fire that intense, but they're used to fire. So they have ligna tubers and things reshot very quickly. Within two weeks, there were strangely tree ferns and drossera growing in puddles and gum trees re-sprouting from their trunks. So I think there's more in wild plants to evoke things from you. But 
cultivated ones, wherever you can get your emotional fix, I think with plants, <laughs> that's what it is. Mm. Yeah, because actually when you said that, I thought about, I was watching an episode of The Walking Dead recently and somebody sheltered in a cornfield. And actually a cornfield is like a forest, but on a smaller level. So I suppose even if you are reading plants at a cultivated level, they're still getting to you on a level that is maybe more primeval. Absolutely. I think as well, there's something really eerie. And I think it's why cornfields are used all the time about sort of a monoculture of something, something that's lined up all in rows and it moves as one big sort of beast. I think that's what it is. I love so many films with scary corn in them. If you start thinking about it, you'll think of all the movies where corn is scary. That's very true, actually. I'm going to look out for it now. Regarding The Secret Garden, which was another one of the books that you suggested having a look through, again, I'd read it before, but I listened to the audio book and it struck me how the garden was healing. So obviously we're talking about plants and emotion, but it was quite interesting that the garden seemed to be healing physically as much as emotionally. Do you think that was the case? Oh, I definitely think that was the case. I have a whole interest in the way that plants and the greater landscape around us not only shapes our emotions, but also can shape our physicality as well. Going back to the trail running that I do out in the bushland here, I've thought about it so much about how plants can affect our physical form. And one of them, again, going back to bushfires, was there is a big slope that I always run down, a big canyon that I run into. And I forgot that the bushfires had happened and I forgot that the entire canopy, what is like usually an evergreen forest, essentially was burnt. And consequently, I didn't put any sun cream on and I got sunburnt. And I thought how basically the plants had affected the melanin in my skin. and we're breathing in the oxygen that they're producing and we're giving them carbon dioxide. I think there's so much interplay between our bodies and plants. And I think that they absolutely emotionally have the ability to heal us, but obviously with herbs and those sort of things they physically do as well. Another thing that struck me was how the garden was working to heal everybody in the book in different ways. So it almost felt like the garden was responding to their individual needs and I wondered if you thought do people instinctively find or seek out what they need in a garden in order to get better or to change whatever it is they need to work on? I think they definitely do I think we're drawn to different things within a garden depending on your personality or how you're feeling at the time I know that I am very emotional about plants, particularly the garden that I work in. And depending on my mood, if I'm wandering around the garden of a morning, I will go to a different place to seek a different feeling from it. So I just read The Woodlanders by Thomas Hardy. And that is such, there's such like a moody feeling about that book. And I wandered down to our North American woodland and I could feel that same sort of dark, moody feeling that I had from that book. And then in October, all our lilacs flower, there's an October long weekend that we have every year and it coincides with the lilacs flowering. And they're something that I seek out when I want to be in that long weekend excited mood. And the scent of them to me just says that I'm going to have four days off. So I think everyone seeks out the different things within a garden that either can help bring out a feeling in them that will maybe help them make peace with something or that can make them feel happy when they want to feel happy or sad when they want to feel sad. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about gardens, so dynamic and they can be so full of so many different things that each person that comes into them can view it in a different way and take a different thing from it. That is so interesting to think about. If you're regularly in a garden, you will know that one day you'll be drawn to doing something. It's not always dependent on what actually needs doing. Sometimes you just feel like being in a certain area or doing a certain thing. So if we could all just take a moment and think about what area we're drawn to and why that might be. That's really an interesting concept. And it's a concept that we certainly wouldn't have a word for, which kind of brings me on to another thing that I was thinking about reading these books, which is that there seems to be a lot of unsaid things and instinctual actions 
around the human connection to plants, we hint at it quite often in magical or scientific terms, and they don't quite fit the bill. And it made me think, you know, do we have the language to describe our relationship to plants? And have we ever had that language? I don't think so. I write a lot of poetry about plants and gardens and the things that I see when I'm out running. And it's a struggle to find a way to explain the different ways that plants make me feel. I've tried very hard and it's actually I have an app on my phone that gives me a new word every day. And it's genuinely something that I think every time a new word comes up, like, is that something that can describe a particular feeling? One of my favorite displays at our garden is the North American springtime ephemerals. So trilliums and sanguinarias and hepaticas. And I was trying to write a sonnet about those. And I get a feeling that's inside me, like it's somewhere behind my solar plexus, the way that I feel about them. And I just don't think that there are words to describe it because maybe our connection with plants, it goes back to before people existed. We've always existed alongside plants. So I think a lot of the feelings that we have to them and the connections we have to them are just inherent in us. And there might not be a way to adequately describe how we feel about them and how we're connected to them. But I try. You might have to start off your whole new language to do it. I think so. Lots of um, like hushing and whooshing. <laughs> and the third book that you recommended was The Overstory, which again, I hadn't read, but I'd listened to the audio book of it and I'm almost at the end of re-listening to it. And I was thinking, obviously, you've experienced the effects of climate and that's a central theme to the book and also environmentalism. And I thought, well, are plants losing their power to connect with us emotionally or vice versa, given our detachment from nature? And one of the things that made me think that was there's a disease mentioned in the book of chestnut trees, which sweeps America. And it's not dissimilar to other plant diseases such as Dutch elm disease or this, you know, ash die back in the UK. And they have caused large scale changes to a landscape. And it could be quite fanciful, but it did make me think, might actually these things, these dramatic changes that are brought about on plants and within plants, it's almost like the trees are shouting at us going, hello, hello, look what are you doing? Because the chestnut disease in the book was caused by the importation of something that brought the disease in with it, which then escaped out into the kind of wider environment in the US. Do you think that could be the case or does that just sound very pie in the sky? I don't think so. Like, firstly, I work with an arborist who would be very unimpressed to ever hear me anthropomorphizing trees. But I think you were talking about the connection and if we're losing connection with plants. And I think, firstly, yes, it definitely is, you know, them saying, help, keep an eye out. If nothing else, it's a great cry to increase hygiene and importation and quarantine. But even just perceiving those sort of things as a cry for help is a great way to enamor people to plants when they aren't necessarily always interested in plants. I mean, that's one of the things I see at a botanic garden. And one of the things that you're always trying to do at a botanic garden is to engage people with plants. And that tends to be the thing that engages people with plants, particularly children, the most is anthropomorphizing them, giving them those human traits. So I have two little boys and when it's daffodil season, the daffodil display at work has hundreds of daffodil cultivars in it. And we like to go through them and decide what the different personalities of the different cultivars are. So if it's a little group of naughty children or a very stern old ladies or if one of them is up to trouble and has taken something from someone else and tried to run away when it's a lone cultivar of a daffodil sitting out amongst a different group. So I think absolutely I like to imagine that trees and plants are telling us things all the time. <laughs> Whether or not that's true, I'm not sure, but I like to think it is. If people wanted to make people think about their connection to plants or sort of spread the word about how amazing it is once you do connect with plants and that there is a kind of discourse between humans and plants, if you wanted to encourage people to do that or maybe suggest to people how they could get other people more involved with plants, what would be your top tip? 
I think it's literally just striking up conversations with people. The thing that I always find is what was your earliest memory of a plant? Or I always like to ask people what personality they think a plant would have. But I think just that's the best way to engage people with plants, children as well. How does this plant make you feel? How does that smell make you feel? Those sort of questions. It's just fun to talk about plants. And I think if you yourself are enthusiastic about a plant and the natural world at large, being enthusiastic about it and being excited about something, people always want to talk to you about it. I really love the idea that we may be drawn to certain parts of the garden and specific tasks depending on our emotional state. There were so many interesting things to emerge from our chat, so thank you very much to Marion for being a guest and thank you to you for listening. I've included links to the books we spoke about so that you can purchase them from my bookshop.org storefront should you so wish and I will get a tiny commission as will your local bookstore if you buy through there. I haven't linked to the Eni Blyton book as I note the newer editions have changed the names of some of the characters and frankly... I don't think there's anything wrong with having a Dick and Fanny in the magic faraway tree, so I can't support this sort of production. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a feature of bugs that we may not wish to become acquainted with too closely. One of the most effective weapons, known to be used by around 100,000 different species of animals worldwide, is venom. A massively diverse range of organic toxins that animals can deploy for both defence and attack. Toxins that over millions of years have become highly effective cocktails that will deliver pain, paralysis or death to their specific targets. Yet only during recent years has science gained the ability to study the complexity of biological chemistry and begin understanding the workings of nature's toxins. Highlighting them as a virtually untapped resource for discovering new active ingredients and developing innovative new products in areas such as health and crop protection. And from what we now know about toxins within the animal kingdom, the most diverse and largest number of venomous species are found amongst the invertebrates. And whilst the venom of species that we coexist with, such as the honeybee, has been well studied, so much remains to be understood about the toxins from most other venomous invertebrates on Earth. Incredibly powerful, precise toxins, such as those of the pompilid wasps, the paralysed tarantulas, the red velvet ant that supposedly will kill a cow, and the executioner wasp delivering the most painful stings of any other creature on Earth. But whilst the toxins in venom have evolved to interact in a specific way with the biology of a victim, understanding just how they work can help us to identify new precise treatments for perhaps controlling certain crop pests without harming other species or the environment, or for developing new medicines and for treating currently incurable illnesses. And the huge potential for this has already been shown by the discovery of a biomolecule that's now used for treating high blood pressure and heart disease, which was found within a snake venom. And currently, amongst the many research projects worldwide that involve animal venom, is one with Australian funnel web spiders that aims to develop a treatment for stroke victims. Whilst another involves the death stalker scorpion whose venom has been found to contain a compound that specifically binds to cancer cells. And so, as we begin to realise that the solutions to our problems may well exist within the natural world, we really need to protect our greatest resource, the planet's biodiversity. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe 
and search for Roots and All podcast. <laughs>